Hey guys, welcome back to the Ondine Extravaganza. I am giving you all my technical tricks and hacks and practice methods for playing a really beautiful Ondine. Um, if you haven't watched the first episode, then I really recommend you go and watch that now and then come back here because there are lots and lots of tips there that you don't want to miss and I will be referring to some of them in this video. So go watch that now and then come back. If you've watched the first video and you've come back, then hello and welcome back and let's continue with the build up, the climax and the beautiful end of Ondine. Let's get started. Okay, so at bar 57, we get to the start of the big build up. And this is the bit that I get most of the questions on. And if you're struggling with this bit, and I mean, who isn't struggling with this bit, then you're in for a bit of a treat because I have got so many suggestions for how you can practice this. Um, so starting off with bar 57, first thing to do is to work on these little trills. So. So each um, shape you isolate, that's the first one, and then, and then, and so on. Okay, so for each of those, you can work on it as a little trill. Making sure that it's perfectly together and relaxed. isolating the movements of each voice and working on the independence so um, so that they're each strong each of the voices is strong but they're still coordinated so you're still practicing that together but you're also working on the individual voice and so on. I mean, I didn't show you all of them, just do the same thing for every uh, unit of that pattern. Uh, the next thing is when you go to the next unit, you hold your thumb. Hold. Hold. So I don't know if you can, I hope you can see that, it's like a pivot. as you're um, pivoting over, but you still have a legato here. So the next thing is to do little blocks. I don't know if you can see on my music, probably you can't, but um, I've got blocks marked in. So that is from the fourth demi semi quaver up until the ninth demi semi quaver. And the reason I'm um, practicing that specifically is because the um, second block, <laughs> this is confusing, the second block is uh, often going to be weaker because you start off on the first one and that's kind of okay. And then by the time you've got to the second one, you've got a bit either tense or a bit off track. So by working extra on this one, you're just making sure that that's going to be secure for you and you're not going to have problems there. And then the next one. So this is from the 12th demi semi quaver through to the, oh gosh, 17th semi quaver. And 
then likewise. So those are your blocks. Then you can practice each beat. And then. So this is where the blocks that we've just done comes in handy because you've already kind of perfected that little section and now you're just building on that. sure that you continue because otherwise you're going to have a um, jolt when you get to the new pattern here so you need to practice that join next thing to practice is each voice separately so the first one the lower voice is actually your anchor point and that's where you're going to be focusing your attention Make sure you use the right fingerings. That's tricky. So through all of this, I should have probably mentioned about the shape of my wrist and my hand. I like to have my wrist quite high here because I want everything to feel very loose and floppy. I don't want to be playing it like this, you know, really kind of um, precise, because I think that is where you're going to get tension coming in. So, because this is not the most important part of this music, the most important part is here. And then this is just a kind of trickling on top. I don't want to be focusing the audience's ears on this part. So, so it's very loose. So I hopefully you can see this kind of like hanging. They're just really floppy there. floppy but I think if you practice in all the methods that I've just shown you you're going to have enough strength there and enough security with the notes that it won't sound floppy it will just sound kind of um, free. The last thing to practice here is a block it's a longer block this time from the fifth quaver of the bar so here <laughs> to do that again. The reason for doing that is because I don't want to have the bars being just separate blocks. It's all very well practicing everything perfectly, but if you then lose the line of the melody, which is this, swelling feeling of the melody and if you lose that then it's kind of all for nothing so in order to avoid um, breaks between the bars you have to practice joining the bars obviously <laughs> at bar 60, this. The movement that I use for this is actually a kind of in-out movement. So to show you in a clear way, in, out, in, out, in, out, in, out. Or it's kind of up, down in a way with your wrist. Okay, 
Okay, so it's very subtle. In the end, I'm not going to play it like that. I'm going to play it more like this. But there's still that slight sense of in and out, and it helps to keep my wrist loose. And this is otherwise very tricky, and I don't want to kind of tense up. So, in the end, it's a very small movement, but it's good to practice. And in fact, when you get to the end of bar 61, as it's um, in the crescendo, it becomes a little bit more pronounced. So, bar 61... it more as the crescendo happens. So let me show you that whole passage. So I think you can see at the end I'm kind of actually moving more in and out more obviously and that is to help with the um, you need more impulse as it gets louder. So I'm almost throwing it. I think probably I would just say practice it the same ways that I recommended for bar uh, 57. So separate voices. With the left hand as well. Just making sure that you actually really know what's going on in that lower voice. And then the top voice. tricky because it's changing more. The bottom voice is basically just the chromatic scale. So doing those two voices separately, practicing in um, blocks. So I probably would also work on each little unit. So you'll probably have noticed the trend by now that um, generally I'm saying work on the component parts, get them relaxed, get them working, you know, loosely and nicely, and then start putting it together in larger sections. We also need to have a block here to cover the join between the bars. So that would be from, again, the fifth quaver of bar 60. To the third quaver of bar 61. So just again. the kind of the surging shape of the melody to make sure that it's smooth. Yeah and then I think the last thing I would do here is just to work on the, the melody of the whole section. So from bar 57, just the melody, um, making sure that you take in whichever hands it's written in. So... It's to try and get this kind of gently undulating melody, even when it's split between the hands, which makes it quite difficult to do. So bar 62 is really the beginning of the climax. Um, we've kind of built up a lot of tension in the preceding few bars. Um, here we are. So the crucial thing here in bar 62 is to get enough in your bass to kind 
kind of contain the whole of the climax within it. So... want a richness to the sound there, so that it can then give way to the... to the climax. So, to practice bar 66, which is the climax bar, um, I also have quite a few little tricks. Uh, firstly, work on the melody with the correct fingers. Okay, so I want to have this kind of overarching uh, power coming down from that top note. Okay, once I've got the melody how I want it to sound, I'm gonna add on the bass, just the bass notes in the left hand, not the whole left hand, just the harmony, note, harmony notes. know what's happening in the left hand and I need to do this more because you can see that I was <laughs> getting confused so um, we want the shape of the melody with the um, main bass notes two bars. Okay, now into the sort of nitty gritty. Um, the first two quavers of bar 66 I divide up into three groups. So one, two, three, one, two, three. So you see I've got a triplet in the right hand in the first quaver and a triplet in the left hand in the second quaver. So it sounds like... about this is because when we get to the climax I don't want to be stressing about where the notes fit I just want to know very clearly that this is how it goes so I don't have to worry about it you need to be able to play with your full power here and so I find it really helpful to have it divided up in that clear way so actually you can't really hear the triplets I don't think when it's up to speed but it helps me to have it clear in my mind what I'm doing Okay, so the next thing to practice is really useful, it's kind of tricky to explain, so bear with me. So what we want is the melody, and then around that we're going to alternate which hand we play. So each quaver, you're going to alternate the hand. So quaver one, right hand. Quaver two, left hand. Again, just to be clear, 
So uh, quaver one, right hand. powerfully um, coordinating your hands and your brain to make sure that they kind of line up correctly. So then you can do it the other way around. So starting with the left hand, right hand, oops, <laughs> left hand, right hand, Especially in the left hand, I find it easy to use the wrong fingers when you're not playing all the notes. So just check which fingers you're using for the bass. Be patient with this, it does take a little while to get your head around it, but I promise it really, really does help to get those, um, all the rhythms lining up properly. I can show you a bit faster. <laughs> So right hand only playing its melody. And then um, I've got another block suggestion for you for the right hand, which is the second quaver. To the third quaver, so this this one, and then likewise the fourth quaver to the fifth, which is this. And we practice those with the left hand. So the effect of this is to make sure that your brain is working fast enough to keep up with the music, and that. Uh, you're on the ball enough to bring the right hand in in the right place that's it without just relying on kind of habit you're actually coming in in the right place with the correct notes it blind and this may sound absolutely crazy but um, it's helpful because in performance you cannot look everywhere at once so practicing well, actually with your eyes shut go slowly and eventually it's going to start feeling much more natural to play and hopefully then you can get it up to speed <laughs> actually focus on the sweep of the melody which is after all the important thing okay moving on to bar 70 a uh, little tiny hack I take the the first spread octave the A sharp this one um, at the beginning of the bar I take the middle 
one in the right hand. So. is because you've got the right hand in the middle in the way here and if you're also trying to play with the left hand you just crash into each other so it's much easier to take and your left hand can just float over the top and again you don't want to be crashing in in the middle here Bar 72, I take that E in the left hand. So I actually went backwards and forwards about this for quite some time because I can play it faster in the right hand. Like a kind of half effect. Which I thought maybe that's good, but in the end I've decided that actually I don't want it to be fast. I want it to be kind of um, mournful and empty and it has to all of the um, all of the tension and all of the kind of harmony from the climax needs to dissolve when we get to this A minor chord it's just kind of released and all the fire has gone out of it so I actually prefer it like this you have much more control this way um so i'd go for slower arpeggio but more control and then of course here practice staccato again and adding on as i showed you in the previous video if you haven't watched that go back and watch it um the fingering here, I do another takeover. I take this in the right hand because then you can just go straight through here. So, bar 74 to 75 again a point of um, many questions so the, the first glissando I don't find too difficult I think I mean let me know if you find that really difficult and I'll have a think but I think for me if you use the side of your finger that's quite gentle but the second glissando in bar 75 I do find difficult because it just sounds too brilliant somehow like that. If you play a glissando, it doesn't sound gentle. I want it to sound like um, the, the most gentle spray of water, you know, almost like you can't feel it. It's kind of evaporating, that's it, evaporating. Like, yeah, water vapour. So I don't want to have this kind of brilliant virtuosic effect. So instead of doing that, I actually play them out by fi with fingers like this. Two, start with two, and then one, two, three, four, five. Left hand, right hand. Okay, and it works out perfectly. So this way you have so much more control over the sound and the colour that you're producing. It takes a little bit of work to make it totally even, but the end effect is far superior in my view. So to show you, I just think it's much more, um, what's the word? It's much more soft and delicate, which is what I want here. So again, practice staccato adding on. It should be just really to nothing by the time you get to the top. Okay, little 
little trick here, um, bar 77, the first beat, I take this D sharp in the left hand and that is because I want to hold the F natural from the pre previous bar you've got in the right hand. This little melody fragment, which is beautiful and needs to come out. But at the same time, you need to change the pedal when you come to the F sharp harmony at the beginning of the bar. So this is another time when you're, you've got two um, priorities which are fighting. So if you play this, you have to change the pedal and then you lose the top F. I hope that makes sense. What I want is to hold the top F, so... If you could see, I'm holding the F and then... change the pedal here but I still have the F holding on and again I'm taking the D only that first D sharp in the left hand of bar 79, I take these first three notes in the right hand. So to me this is the smoothest fingering that allows space for the hands to move naturally and uh, avoids bumps. So. Um, To this very lonely little um, melody. Ondine is sad because she's been spurned by the man that she was trying to seduce. So everything has evaporated. And um, personally, depending on the acoustic of the hall, I actually don't want it to be totally dry. I feel like I want there to be some, I don't know, some kind of harmonic atmosphere still around. Not exactly sound, but just a kind of vibration that um, is left from everything that's happened before. So this is, you know, a matter of personal preference. But for me, I like to have a tiny bit of harmonics in this section. Um, so you, you can do this if you want by holding down this chord in the left hand, just very silently. You don't want to play them, obviously, but just slightly hold them down. And then when you play the right hand melody, it picks up on the harmonics. very subtle and this would totally depend on the acoustic of the hall that you're playing in you wouldn't want it to be really noticeable or kind of crass um, but when I've played this it's worked really beautifully and it kind of has this I don't know magic kind of aura about it which I like um, of, of course you could also use a little bit of pedal if you wanted to but this is my favorite way because I think it's subtle and you can also just clear it if you need to, if it's getting a bit too much, you can just let one of the notes go, um, clear it slightly. But it just means... It's just 
kind of behave and then let it go here. This is the kind of sour, you know, she's pouting. All right, we're on the last page. So this mad kind of laughter, it's like this cackling, almost hysterical kind of, um, I don't care anyway, kind of laughter. So. laughter things coming down very very awkward so the ways to practice this um, you need to have an upward movement of the right hand that's partly to have the kind of the impact that you need for ha 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 but also to get out of the way of your left hand. Okay, so that's my first tip, practice going up. Secondly, what's really awkward about this bit is the left hand shape. You can see that's very unnatural shape. It's the sort of gap between the second and fourth fingers. So what's really causing the issue is the left hand fourth finger, I think. Um, I would practice with a chord in the left hand. Just to get the shape, you know, make sure that you're getting the right shape. That's actually already much easier. So that tells me that it's not the shape in itself, but it's getting to that note. So to practice that, I would be doing... And then, so you've done one note and chord, two notes and a chord remember that you still want the right hand to be up and the last thing that I would do in practicing this little bit is um, upside down. So instead of going downwards, I would be going. It's just a different perspective on the shape of the chord. And it also allows you to practice this nice kind of upward shape. Or the upward motion of the right hand. Okay, so we've got the upward motion of the right hand, we've got practicing the shape of the left hand, and then we've got practicing upside down. I hope that a combination of those things will help, but it's also just a bit of patience on this one. Um, the arpeggios, um, again adding on um, note by note. For this bit, we don't want to press into the keys, so although it's fortissimo, I would say we want strong fingers but loose hands and wrists. So it, the effect is a kind of waggling, um, waggling fingers. I don't know if you can see that or if it's too fast, but I've got these kind of quite straight and um, fast moving fingers, but they're not kind of in any kind of awkward shape, but they're actually quite relaxed. Most important.
important thing here is not the notes, it's this kind of, um, I don't know, nasty laughing effect. <laughs> sharp in the left hand this last tiny little bit the last couple of bars the, actually the motion of this is kind of similar to the um, fortissimo passage I just mentioned. Straight fingers and high wrist. Because I want it to, it, it needs to go back to the mood of the beginning, this kind of shimmering. I'm not too precise, I think if you play it like this, it's going to sound much too precise and kind of energetic and I don't want energy. Fingering, I do a different fingering on the way up than I do on the way down um, because you have a different hand shape on the way up. When you're going up you're like this, you're kind of um, this shape and then on the way down you have your elbow out I use the three on the way down and two on the way up. You're kind of reaching on the way up. Oh, how am I doing? And on the way down, it just falls naturally, I think, with the three. So I don't necessarily assume that it has to be the same fingering on the way up and the way down. It depends on the shape of your hand. For me, it's better two on the way up and three on the way down. Um, with this last three bars, again, to go back to the pedal, I mentioned this in the first episode, but it needs to be a very subtle kind of fluttering pedal, not all the way down. The reason for this is that the last bar just has to evaporate here. And we don't want to be left with lots of pedal. So it needs to be off by the time you finish. If you have a full pedal during the penultimate bars, you don't have enough time to fully release that pedal. Or if you do, it's going to sound obvious. So in order to avoid that, you need to have this very subtle half pedal here. It's only a tiny bit down. without slowing down so it just has to kind of disappear off by itself and we don't want to be taking time to release the pedal um, I actually think maybe I didn't quite get this in my video um, I think I had a little bit too much pedal on that day in this end section and so I had to take a little bit of time in order to get the pedal off and it slightly affects the um, pacing of the end. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that was bad timing. When you finish practicing the end, I would like to go back to the beginning because I think when you've got the, the, the atmosphere of the end, this kind of still shimmering, that's what you want to bring to the beginning. So the way I like to think about this is as if you're just joining in with something that has been there forever. So it's not like you're starting something new, you're not starting a piece, you're not starting a melody. You're just kind of tuning into it, it's already there. So this is why I really like to practice after I finish the piece to go back to the beginning and have that sort of wash of sound already in my mind. And I'm just joining in again, uh, just joining in again.
You know, Undine's still there. She's there, always immortal, kind of repeating this story over and over again. That's how I like to imagine it. I really, really hope that you've got something useful out of this. It's been actually really fun for me to make this video. I've enjoyed writing down all my tips. It's been fun. Um, so thank you to everyone who has asked questions about this and I hope this helps you. Uh, let me know in the comments if there's anything that I haven't covered or any other tricks that you find useful because I am always keen for new tricks. And um, if you like the video then please remember to give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more practice ideas. And I will see you next time. Bye.